My Island, VTR number 117199, recorded February 22nd, February 2nd, Act 1. This old diary is where I've penned my thoughts over the past four years. You know, traveling like I do with the Irish Rovers has taken me all over the world, and a good part of my life is spent living in hotels and in airplanes, and I've come to the conclusion that everyone needs a special place to go, a, a kind of an island all of their own to forget the world's rush. It doesn't really matter, you know, where this place is, as long as you can find a wee bit of peace of mind there. Some years ago, I discovered my island, across the Northumberland Strait from New Brunswick and Nova Scotia in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. There's my special place. It's called Prince Edward Island. In this diary, I put some poems about life as I see it there. They're just kind of simple words about an island that I would really love to show you. So why don't you journey with me over the changing seasons there and perhaps something of that warmth and peace of mind will rub off on you too. Take a walk in summer with me, down the many small roads that wind and weave their way over the face of Prince Edward Island, and I will show you secrets you may have forgotten, feelings that left you long ago, for I am the spirit of your childhood. Look once more through my eyes, and you'll discover all of the things that you used to know before you let them steal your summers away. I'll remind you of the names of the flowers and of the songs of the birds, about letters penned on birch bark and how to whistle through broad grass stalks, the way to press leaves in Sunday Bibles, the taste of roadside strawberries tart and those black sweet pearls along the bramble briar, how to weave a daisy chain and spend an hour close to the spinning spider. But most of all, I'll teach you a little more of love, for down these roads, God lives. On quiet summer mornings, you'll find him if you try.
With the dull drumming coming down the copper red and standard bread trotter on the road to Rusty Cove. Just Harry and his daughter and the trotter that he bought her in the morning, Harry stopped to say hello. She's as good as any filly on the island, daughter smiling top to bottom, she's as fine as fine can be. We'll run her in the summer on the track, she'll be a winner, then we'll take her to Toronto. She's a beauty, you'll agree. Do you want to take the trotter and the daughter for a mile or two? I'm telling you, you'll like the way she moves along the track. She's as smooth as velvet britches, hold her back, stay off the ditches, now and then she'll need a handy little crack. So away with Harry Strotter and the lovely little daughter humming drumming down the road to Rusty Cove. Now I've been to many places, seen many smiling faces, but they kind of lose their glamour, I declare. When I think about the Trotter and Harry Campbell's daughter, hmm, it's still the sweetest way to travel anywhere. Kentucky North, Charlottetown Pacers compare with the best. Ask any horseman, you'll find it's true. Now I drove Ballard's top man round in a mad plunge to the post. The moment the starter's truck pulled away like a bat out of hell, lumps of mud spinning, whizzing missiles passed my terrified stare. Huge rump pounding, tail up in the air. An unnatural wind in my face. Rhythm bouncing off the rail. Jesus, if he tips, I'm arse over tea kettle. And how do I stop the devil? Help! Miss Pat McGinty, I own a racing mare, and many's the mile in the good old style I race her everywhere. The reins I lift, the whip I crack, take up your seat, beware, for many's the fall I've taken in the races at the fair. The reins I lift, the whip I crack, take up your seat, beware, for many's the fall I've taken in the races at the fair. At all the fairs and racetracks, me likes you'll never see. All the handsome boys and girls around me flock with glee. Here comes Pat the darling on his little racing mare. I'll treat you fine with some moonshine to fill your heart with cheer. The reins I lift, the whip I crack, take up your seat, beware. For many's the fall I've taken in the races at the fair. Me horse, she is a beauty, full of island wit and fun. She is 20 years ago today, her racing life begun. Now we haven't won too many, but on looking back I see that winning doesn't matter, boys, if you're happy, feeling free. The reins I lift, the whip I crack, take up your seat, beware. For many's the fall I've taken in the races at the fair. The reins I lift, the whip I crack, take up your seat, beware. For many's the fall I've taken in the races at the fair. Whee!
That old house in the post there is where Lucy Maud Montgomery lived, and she used that location to set her famous girl's book, Anne of Green Gables. Lucy Maud kept a diary here, and while I was writing mine, I was thinking to myself that Lucy used Anne as a kind of an extension of her daydreams. And even though she had children of her own, Anne, that child of her imagination, lives on and on. They say that after Old Home Week, the tourist season is over, and that's when they board up their cottages and sail away to their own worlds across the Northumberland Strait. And with the harvest in, this is the Islanders' time, a time of coming together to share a great wealth of song and music. Horse and man work together again, once a year just for all lang syne. I remember the time my grandfather had to do it that way. He let me sit astride that giant Clydesdale with sides so wide, my boyish legs could hardly make the curve. From up there, the dizzy bobbing of Spencer's head, and the way behind the dark wake, the old man cursing gently at the biting blade. The plowshares and Dundas leave a red sod turned, and a young man of 4-H affiliations laughs 
It was a lucky damn thing old Massey and Ferguson got together. They have step dancing here as well, a fiddler or two. There's quilts and baking and raspberry preserves. Ah, it's good to leave the freeway for a while and meet your friends where the plowman bears a piece of yesterday to awaken our senses. <laughs> I suppose when people nowadays think about Prince Edward Island, they think of lobsters and they think about little lobster boats, but there was a time in history, as you fellas will vouch for me, when I say that there was a time in history when Prince Edward Island sent some of the finest looking ships in the world out into the waters. Oh, there was, yeah. Yeah. I thought you're a man that, that remembers those days in your models. And I, I was in your house not long ago, and I was never so envious, I don't think, in my whole life. When I walked around your living room, and there sitting in every corner was some of the most magnificent little ship's models I have ever seen. They are so intricate in every detail. You, you, how long have you been building model ships? Oh, well, I, I started, I came back home about 1955, and... Uh, I started then, you know, and uh, I always wanted to build them, but it was always my, you know, I was interested in ships. And, and you build them authentically, right from the old blueprints as well. And I want to, you know, kind of remember what the old ships were like in the old days, you know, and uh, give them something to look back on. I didn't build them to sell them, just for, uh, I love ships so much that I just wanted to build them and have them, you know. Robert, you know a lot about schooners. You've sat and told me hours and hours uh, of your experiences on, on the schooners, that you, you worked on them. When did you start working on schooners? Well, I was about 15 years old. But uh, I was about 15 years old when I hit the board three miles of schooner down the island, Nova Scotia. Yeah? And we went down to Cuba. Well, if you fellas had the opportunity again, now, Robert, well, you were 15 years old when you went off to sea. When you look back on those days now, would you do it all over again? Those days, hard times. Would you? Did you enjoy it? Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, my uh, grandfather, on my father's side, had a, a black and dean called the Alberta, and he caught yellow fever, and he was buried at sea down off of San Fugo, that's on the south side of Cuba. Uh huh. And my father was born at sea off the coast of Ireland. Was he? And uh, so. I, I guess it didn't actually come along. I'd like to see. What kind of money would you make in those days as a young seaman serving on a schooner when you went down to say with a load and you, how long would you be away from home, Jack? You weren't away as long as Robert here. You did oh, short no. runs. No, no, no. Robert, when you went away to sea, you'd go for a year at a time, would you? I booked for a year, yeah. You signed on for a year. Would it be a dangerous job in a heavy seas going up to the top of the mast there when you're going up to fix the sails? Oh, I don't, I don't think it would I wouldn't call it dangerous. It's particularly dangerous, unless it was blown off hard. And what, did you have to go up sometimes when it was blown hard? Not time when the tops were got loose and, and they have to go up and tie them up again. That was about the only time. Did you ever lose any of the men on the ship from going when up the I lost a man overboard off of Newfoundland. He got hit with the uh, tail of a sail, knocked him overboard. He belonged to Grand Command, and we couldn't do anything about saving him. Bloat's hired. We couldn't round up to him. There's another thing when I uh, all ship model. I never, never uh, worked on a ship model on Sunday. You've never done it on Sunday. Why is that? Well, when I was a kid, the, the uh, sailors never believed in driving a nail on Sunday on the ship if they could help it. Bad luck. And it was kind of driven into me. I often heard them talk about it. Was there lots of superstitions among sailors about yeah. things they wouldn't do? Tell us some of the superstitions We're about ship. hatch upside down. Oh, really? What was that? You went aboard of a vessel, a hatch, you know, down the hole there, the hat cover goes yes. over it. You turn that upside down. Never done. Oh. You know, Captain put your show up pretty quick. Wouldn't put a loaf of bread upside down. No, please. sir. You wouldn't do what? Wouldn't have a loaf of bread turned upside down. Especially always, a hatch. I always the way it was baked. No. What did they say about whistling on board a ship? Did you ever hear oh, that superstition? Oh, yes, they wouldn't let you whistle. Oh, no. You wouldn't be allowed to whistle? Oh, no, no. Oh, that was bad luck. Did you ne were you never tempted to just, when you got all on your own, going... <laughs> oh, yes, but oh, you get them awful looks. <laughs> what, would he, what, would they, what was supposed to happen if you did these things? What would happen? Bad luck to the ship, like? It didn't know what was happening, but it was bad luck. What about women on board a ship? 
Well, some I wouldn't carry a woman, but uh, that, uh, that... I fish lobster on that old fellow. Come down. Pardon? I fish with an old fellow, Donald Steele. Joe Ida's way down Sturgeon down there. Oh, he wouldn't have a girls or women at all. He even touch his dory. He fish in a flat bottom dory. Or whistle. When I was a kid, how uh, the salt got into my blood first. Yeah. I was going to uh, the exhibition with my grandfather, Charlottetown. He used to leave the train to leave about seven o'clock in the morning. And there was a big two top schooner just turning, getting ready to sail out. And the uh, sun was coming up. And uh, it's one of the prettiest sights I ever saw, and ever after I, I was fond of schooners. Can you remember the name of that one? No, it could have been uh, Urania. I don't know, but she owned the money. They were the best damn shipwrights in the whole country. My father ought to know. He grew up in them and sailed the world on Lunenburg schooners and Yankee steamers. Ah, he knew his boats all right. What I know, I suppose I got from him. Maybe we got a reputation here on the island for being farmers and lobster men. Well, believe me, men like him were sailors. And I'm not talking about your dories or lobster boats or lumber scows. There were deep sea sailors among them. From our small island came good ships and better shipbuilders than we get credit for. With the tiny mast and rigging set, he then drifted away in the pipe dream of a day when a small boy waited barefoot, breathless, as a white hull beauty slid down the ramp and into the river, restless to taste the wind and soar beyond the small island world with his father there at the wheel, like a part of the ship, waving and full of joy at the life. Someday, his father yelled after. That someday came and went with the last of the tall ships. And except for a stint in the Navy, his sailing is now done, fancy free, aboard his beautiful tabletop schooners. into their ways as easy as memory that comes of those kitchen nights in Ireland. Kitchens that were made to sing and step dance in. Places to laugh at foolish stories. Don't even bother with the living room. That's for wakes and weddings, for Sunday mornings after church. Kitchens on the island are like that. For beer beneath tables in galvanized tubs of ice. Tables that groan with all the little breads, butters and whatnots that the ladies bring. Music sounds better there without a doubt. Island kitchens, the fuller the better, too. Oh, I've played my music in Carnegie Hall, the Sydney Opera House and White House Ball. But from the top of a stove or a fridge, a sink or the dresser, by God, music there feels better. 
best of all. Just like my poem said, music in the kitchen to me always sounds the best of all. I know it. And when the old days we used to have parties and they were all kitchen parties. And one night I went to a party and I was scared to come home. They said there was a bear around. A bear? A bear. A bear walked across the ice in the winter time and was on Prince Edward Island. And I was scared to death to come home. And on my way home I was walking along. There were no paved roads then, and I was walking along. And all at once, my hands went into hair, fuzzy, fuzzy hair. And a man with the beard was following you. And, no, <laughs> it was a cow. A cow. It was a cow, but I got scared to death. I suppose parties knows that you didn't really have to depend on drinking and things like that to no, have a good time. No, 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 no. No, there was no radios, no anything of the So we had to get together in the evening to play And we games had some cards. moonshine. The men would make moonshine. But you didn't get anything. No, that. we didn't get no moonshine. Until oh, we had a little sip now and again. Just to keep the party going a little bit, yeah. Going. But it was nothing serious at all. No, no, no. Dear, no. And, and, well, like, I heard, Matilda, that you would go to a party and you wouldn't get home all week. Is that true? <laughs> oh, yes, we took off with the horse and sleighs, three or four sleighs. It was about 7 o'clock in the evening. Yeah. We'd head for Alley Crashes. Oh, yeah. So we'd get there, we'd dance all night. There was a barrel of beer there, and you just had to put your glass under it and have a little snort. Uh -huh. And we'd dance all night at 7 o'clock in the morning. And, and you stay the whole night, like? The whole night long. You see, danced. young people nowadays think that kitchen parties are fuddy duddies and they have to go to they have to go to discos and things. They don't know what they're missing. No, they don't they're know what the they're missing. Oh, most you have to wonderful do wonderful things ever was those kitchen parties. Yeah. You can't beat them. You know, I like autumn in, on the island because there's a lot of kitchen parties that go on and. Every autumn time, of course, is a time of remembrance for a lot of people on Prince Edward Island because a lot of young fellas from Prince Edward Island went off to war. And, Joe, you were telling me that you're celebrating a special time this year. This is your 90th birthday. Yeah. When is it? A couple of days from now? The day after tomorrow, 10th of May. Well, that's fantastic. I hope, I hope I'm, I'm as lively as you when I'm your age, I'll tell you that. You were telling me some incredible stories while we were sitting having a cup of tea you were telling me about World War I, and the more you told me about it, the more I realized that I don't know that much about it. And I'm sure I'm like a, a lot of young people in this country. Well, I'm not too young, but a lot of younger people in this country, they know nothing about World well, War I, nor do oh, they no. care, which oh. is the sad part, because... Well, that's, it, it's 60 years ago. It's 60 years ago, but nevertheless, wouldn't you well, think that it didn't... young people now, they don't know anything about it. But do you think that's right? Don't you think they should know a little more about well, it? Well, they should. Mm -hmm. I don't see why the people have to hide that. Well, because you were very proud of the fact that you volunteered. I volunteered, certainly. I volunteered to save our country and save the people from in, in Canada. And how many that, of you went? That, that's what we went to war for. If we didn't, what would become of Canada? Well. When I went to France, Joe, and I saw all those crosses, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds oh, of them, sure. and I saw the great monument at Vimy Ridge, sure. and, and I sat there and I thought about all the young Canadians that were there, and I suppose all I could comment and think to myself was, thanks be to God that I wasn't there. And I'm sorry that you had to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody got to be. I got a little song, Joe, I'm going to sing, and it's about a, a young Canadian. Let me get my guitar. It's, a, it's about a young Canadian called Willie McBride, and I'm going to dedicate it to you and to all the old fellas that are left that know about the terrible horror of war. Well, how do you do, Private William McBride? Do you mind if I sit here down by your graveside? I'll rest for a while in the warm summer sun I've been walking all day and I'm nearly done And I see by your gravestone you were only 19 When you joined the glorious fallen of 1916 And I hope you died quick and 
I hope you died clean Or William McBride Was it slow and obscene Did you leave a wife Or a sweetheart behind In some loyal heart Is your memory enshrined And though you died Back in 1916 to that faithful heart Are you always 19? Or are you just a stranger Without even a name Forever enclosed Behind some glass pane Just an old photograph Torn and tattered and stained And fading to yellow In a brown leather frame did they beat the drum slowly? Did they sound the fight lowly? Did the rifles fire o'er you as they lowered you down? Did the bugles sing the last post in chorus? Did the pipes play the flowers of the bones? Bronzed and captured, forever running, Three young island men who gave theirs at Vimy or at the Somme in Passchendaele. Foreign places that would never let them return to the towns and villages they loved along the shores of PEI. Bronzed and captured forever running against the traffic now for those who died and gloriously laid down their lives, we must sprint on and on. And George W. Hall who molded us from clay we wonder if he meant for us to be attacking the Hun or to simply be running away back to all we loved before our island home sent all our finest off to a war that somehow caught our fancy and danced us over to France. Once a year, a few old men will lift a hat and wipe an eye at our frozen faces that are held in youthful determination forever. <laughs> We should be glad to run, never to grow as old as the ones who hobble up year after year to remember. And I can't help but wonder, now Willie McBride, do those that lie here, do they know why they died? Did you really believe them? when they told you the cause. Did you really believe that this war would end wars? For the suffering and the sorrow and the glory and the shame and the killing and the dying, it was all done in vain. For Willie McBride, it's all happened again and again and again. And again, and again Did they beat the drum slowly? Did they sound the fight lowly? Did the rifles fire o'er you As they lowered you down? Did the bugles sing the last post in chorus? Did the pipes play the flowers of the
when you travel down country roads, sooner or later you'll come across an old abandoned house. Lonely kind of places that somehow intrigue me. Something always makes me want to explore the overgrown garden and the rusted out implements. I'll stand outside those crumbling walls and wonder just what went on inside in the past and who were the ones that lived there and, and played yesterday's music. Oh, if some magic would allow me to stand beyond the tumbled door and have all the scenes that played within since the house began come back to me in color and sound. The homespun faces, the songs, the smell of new bread and lye soap. To see the children that found their way to an eight-hour day in Toronto or Halifax. Or the ones that the sea took, boats and traps and all. Within those four walls in the forest clearing near my place, I come sometimes to touch and remind myself how important every moment is to me on this island. Before my walls crumble, I must fill them with love and light and laughter and music and children. Children with a bottomless bucket of paint. These are some old photographs that I found in the old house. Photographs of the people who used to live there. They were lying dirty on the floor. Country roads on the island will offer up here and there worn houses that long ago summer suns and winters harsh have grayed the hand-hammered boards. In the quiet of a bright January morning, I crept round Ernie Cooper's life that used to be. A pair of shoes atop of the crooked stairs as though he had just slipped them off and away across the summer meadows, barefoot to meet his maker, as it were. The iron lifter still poised in the lid of the wood-eating stove, his teapot rusty, still waiting for its breakfast boil. There was a water-stained photo of Ernie, disguised as a Canadian airman guitar player, scattered among the music sheets of Hank Snow's favorite. Another one of Don Messer and his Islanders, poised over a CBC microphone in Charlottetown, 1947. My steps in the snow around the barn were gone the next time I passed, but I heard Hank and Don and Ernie playing behind the battered door. thinking when everybody's having such a great time and there's beautiful Christmas trees and warm fires and everybody has got everything they want at Christmas time nowadays. I was just thinking there was a time when little boys and girls didn't have hardly anything at Christmas time at all. And I happen to know a song about a little girl. As a matter of fact, I wrote the song with my brother and it's about a, a little girl mm -hmm. who had nothing at all. She didn't even have a mummy and daddy at Christmas time. And she was called the little match girl. And the only way she could ever... Come on over here and I'll tell you the story anyway. Come here. The only way she could ever get any money for her Christmas presents was to go in the cold snow and sell matches. And that wasn't very happy at all. Come on over here, Darren. You better jump up. Come on, quick. 
It's a good story. You'll like it. It's called The Little Match Girl. Bring her up there. You ready? I see in my dreams on a cold Christmas morning visions of sugar plums that dance in my head turkeys and puddings toys for the children but here in the city it's goodwill towards men please buy my matches two for a penny to give you some cheer on a cold christmas day a long time ago a babe in a manger came to this earth God's love for to show he told us that the poor would inherit his kingdom but here in the streets I'm alone in the snow please buy my matches two for a penny to give you some cheer on a cold Christmas day There's peace and there's plenty Behind lighted windows There's singing and dancing And hearts full of cheer But I have to sell matches The world's ill divided But I remember good times When my mother was near Please buy my matches, two for a penny, to give you some cheer on a cold Christmas day. By the heat of my matches, I sit in the doorway, when a vision of peace comes into my mind. It looks like my mother has come back to hold me to take me to Christmas where people are kind please buy my matches two for a penny to give you some cheer on a cold Christmas day Pretty nice piece. Did you like that song? Yes, I sure did. Well, you know something? My grandmother at Christmas time, she was a great storyteller. Yeah. And when I first met you up in Montague, by the way, there's a young lady who's got something for you, George. Oh, I, I know see you don't her. touch Thank the stuff, you. but um, Thank you. I thought you'd taken the pledge. Oh, I thought I would, but I guess I'll have to try, try and do it again. Why not? <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, I was telling you, my granny was a great storyteller, and at Christmas time she used to tell us ghost stories. And when I was sitting one night down in Montague, you started telling me ghost stories, and George, I swear I didn't sleep half the night. You were talking about forerunners and things. Yeah, I've seen great forerunners in my life, dear. You know, it, it's strange, but all through the countryside, even my grandmother, she used to tell about hearing knocks, and yeah. sometimes at a certain time, and that knocking was heard, that someone belonging to the family would die. Have you ever heard anything like yeah, that? Right uh, yeah, Mr. Tupman there, he had uh, three knocks on the door one night. He went to the door to find out what was there, and there was nothing there. And then mm -hmm. he went and sat down again, and then there was three knocks again came. And then he went back again, there was nothing there. And the third time came, there were three knocks, and he went back again, there was nothing there. But the next morning, Maynard Aiken had died, and he lived in that house. He was born and, and raised up in that house. That was his family home. Well, you would think, George, that there's some truth in that. Do you, do you feel that there's some truth in, in yes. people actually getting warnings of death like yes, that? Yes, dear, they are. They are. You can, you can take it from me. I'm telling you the truth. George, I think the best thing to do at Christmas time is forget about ghosts and dying mm -hmm. and live a little. Yeah, live a little. Why not? Well, enjoy yourself. Oh, <laughs> Mother's love's a, a blessing. blessing. No nope. matter where she goes. Lovely, George. Treat her while she's living. <laughs> You'll miss her when, when she, she goes. goes. And through the world of torment. Right. As people all in gray. You'll never miss, miss her your mother. mother. Love to. She's buried beneath the clay. <laughs> I thought we were going to sing a happy song. <laughs> here, here, George. 
Mark. Come on, let's have a little fiddle music. The chase songs are going to lever her up. season in full swing, the island wraps up for the long winter ahead. Farmers have banked their houses against the chill and fishermen have hauled their boats close up against the house well covered. And I suppose the tourists are all safely snug in some neon lighted winter city. Well, it's then that the island gives the Christmas season all she's got. I'll tell you there's turkey in every oven, there's good times in wood heated kitchens, hospitality overflows. It's a good old crack, I tell you. You can't truly be an islander until you face the storm, until you brave the winter on a bleak December morn. Oh, it's easy in the summer, the tourists will agree. They leave with hearts and cameras full of pretty memories. But hide the long cold days from them and the miles of muddy spring. You have to really love the place to stay when winter sings. When you're well snowed in and the plows can't come and you wake at dawn with a frozen bum. Your pipes are ice and your oil runs out. The fire won't draw and there is no doubt that you'd love to fly to some tropic climb and leave this winter far behind. Still. What is life if all your days are mellow summer warm? If you sail along on a gentle breeze and never face the storm? Now where's the joy of bright blue skies if you've never felt the gray? Try a taste of island life on a stormy winter day. Our little span needs all the sound and color it can find. We'll fill your cup up to the brim. Drop by the island in the winter time. My gift to you today, said the island, is my green growing time. When the late spring descends like a blessing, when the last cold wind loses their way high up, dry up and disappear for a season. So here is all the goodness I have to give, whispered by me in every woody lane and every forest clearing and meadowland. Borrow my feathered songsters for your garden, soak in my salty seashores, Open your mind to the possibility that you can find a certain peace here, more than any other. Then fold yourself in my days, easy for a time, and let me flow over your searching. For I am a snug harbor, I'm a lull in the storm, I'm your last touch of yesterday's kindness, 
your fulfillment today. I'm your tomorrow's daydream, and though the world has beckoned with her rewards, oh, I never could fulfill all my restless brood, still, I sleep wise in the knowing that you will touch me one more time. Your sons and daughters will carry the moments that you wove within my nooks and crannies. Their children's children will come and stop a while. I will let them know that they belong, for I am their roots. I am the island, their ancient mother. A warm wind and a summer dream Sail me down the sea Across the gulf, across the strait To the rolling lands of fancy free And the green fields and the red clay road of the island we dispel that follows me in my dreaming and in the stories that I tell. <laughs> 